Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We have to learn to want his presence. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, not his presence. P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Okay, what's that all about? Well, first of all, from the shepherd's point of view, the table is called, it's the tablelands, and that's actually a high plateau on the top of a mountain range. They're very hard to get to, but very good, healthy grass up there. Sometimes God will lead us even to a place that's been hard for us to get to because it's going to be the best thing for us once we get there. And the shepherd goes in ahead of time and he prepares that, that table land with salt and minerals spread out on the ground for the benefit of the sheep. He makes sure the ranges has good healthy grass and good vegetation. He checks for poisonous weeds because he knows, and I love this, there are even some flowers which even though they're beautiful are deadly. Come on, let's see. There's some, he, he knows the sheep's going to go in there and eat anything that looks good. Well, I mean, if it's good, it's good. But not everything that looks good is good. Amen. Amen? Not every person who pays you all kinds of compliments and makes on over you has a right motive in mind. A lot of people are trying to use you or abuse you or misuse you. So... The shepherd knows that even some beautiful things are poisonous and they're going to kill you. And so sometimes he'll take something away from you that you think looks good. And what, what is all this about? We must trust God. Well, the devil, the devil, the devil. Let me tell you something. The devil is alive and well on planet earth and he will come against us. But if you really put yourself in God's hands and you love him with your whole heart, God is going to make sure that there is no devil in hell that can really do you any permanent damage. Now, I believe that God has a table set all the time that he wants us to come and eat at. But a lot of times we don't know how to receive what God wants us to have and what he has prepared for us because we don't see ourselves the way that God sees us. So we're going to go look at 2 Samuel chapter 9 and get a, what I believe is a great lesson from the Word of God. You know, in God's economy, you don't have to deserve everything that God does for you. You just need to believe that He's good. How do you feel about yourself? What do you think of yourself. The good news is, is we're all people that are flawed. We make mistakes. We have weaknesses and we have failures, but God loves us anyway. And one of the best things that you can find in the Word of God is simply this, that when you're in trouble, even if you haven't been a perfect specimen of spirituality, you go to God and He will help you anyway. That doesn't mean that he won't deal with us about our problems, but he doesn't say, well, I'm not going to help you because you've done this, and I'm not going to help you because you've done that. So no matter what you've done wrong in your life, if you're at a point this morning where you want to serve God and you're willing to, to turn away and try to learn to do right, you do not have to be bashful in asking God to do anything for you. You don't have to deserve God's goodness to get it. It's called mercy. God, I ask you to bless me and prosper me beyond my wildest imagination. And boy, the next thing you're going to hear is the devil saying, well, you don't deserve that. And then if you really know who you are in Christ, you can say, yeah, and that's the good news of the gospel. I don't deserve it, but Jesus deserved it. And I get it because I come to God in his name, not because I go in my own name. It's just almost like too good to be true.
So here's the best analogy in the Word of God. 2 Samuel 9, chapter, verse 1. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I might show mercy and kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, th this is not, this would be just equivalent to God saying, Is there anybody in the body of Christ that I can be good to for Jesus' sake? Jonathan and David had a covenant relationship, just like we have a covenant relationship with God. And covenant relationship meant so much more to them than we understand today. But when you were in a covenant relationship with somebody, everything that you had was available to them. Everything that they had was available to you. And it not only worked in your relationship, but it went down your bloodline even to your children and grandchildren after that. And so now, Jonathan is dead, but David's still alive, and he's king. Saul is dead. And he's wanting to do something for somebody that was in the bloodline of his covenant friend, Jonathan. Now, if you're a sharp little saint this morning and you listen, you're going to get something here. And out of the house of Saul, there was a servant whose name was Ziba, and when they called to him, called him to David, he said, are you Ziba? And he said, yes, I am. And the king said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I might show kindness? And he says, yes, Jonathan, now watch verse 3, yes, Jonathan still has one son who is lame in his feet. Now what that means is, well, yeah, there's this one guy, but he's got all kinds of things wrong with him. He's not the guy you'd want to help. He, he doesn't deserve any help. He's, he's got a lot of issues in his life. And the king said, where is he? And he said, well, he's in the house of Maker, the, lives in a place called Lodibar. And verse 5, the king said, have him brought. And in verse 7, I love this. David said to him, fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. You know, God is wanting to say to you, don't be afraid. Don't live in fear over your past mistakes, even if that mistake was this morning. I will show you kindness for Jesus' sake. I want to be good to you, not because you deserve it or you've earned it, but because of what Jesus did in your behalf. This is what it means to be in Christ. Amen. Somebody ought to be getting happy. And... Um, David said, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather. And watch this. And you shall eat at my table always. My table. Now, eat means receive. And actually there are one, two, three, four times between now and the end of this chapter that he says, eat at my table, eat at my table, eat at my table, even though you're lame in both feet, come and eat at my table. And this, I mean, this just did an amazing thing for me years ago when I first got this revelation because I felt bad about myself because of all the things that had gone wrong in my life. And even though I was now a Christian serving God, I paid more attention to what I did wrong in life than I ever did to what Jesus had done right for me. I was more sin conscious than I was God conscious. Come on, is anybody home out there? Don't be so focused on all your faults. Confess them, ask God to forgive you for them, but then go on and keep your eyes on Him. And be bold in prayer. Go ahead and ask God for everything that you want, need, and even things that you would like, and do it loudly and without fear, not because you deserve it, but because you are a child of God and you come in Jesus' name. I'll never forget a woman that I ran to in a store one time. She was working at a department store, and she'd been a Christian for a long, long time, but she was part of a, of a, a Christian denomination that I guess didn't teach too much about how generous God wanted to be with us. And so I was asking her how things worked in her job. Did she get paid on commission, or did she make a salary? And and she said, well, we actually make a salary, but we still have quotas that we have to keep. And if we don't keep those quotas, then we'll lose our job. And uh, 
she said, uh, I, I just haven't had a lot of customers lately. And I, we'd been talking, so I knew she was a Christian. And I said, well, why don't you just pray and ask God to send people over to your department? And she looked at me like I had three heads. I mean, now this is a woman who's been in church like 30 years of her life, and she doesn't know that she can ask God to give her favor with people and send clients to her. And she looked at me and she said, well, would it be okay to do that? And I said, well, of course. God wants to bless you, but listen to me today. You have not because you ask not. If you're not going to ask God for anything, you're not going to get anything. And I would rather ask God for a lot and get half of it than to ask him for a little and get all of it. God is not going to get mad at you for asking. The worst thing that can happen is you won't get it. So stop being fearful. Now watch this. Verse 8. After, after David had said, come and eat always at my table, verse 8, and the cripple bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Now there was the problem. So I have to ask you again, how do you see yourself? What you think about yourself is more important than what anybody else thinks about you. Do you see yourself the way God says you are in his word? Or are you still listening to the lies of the enemy? Get off that works treadmill where you think that you have to earn and deserve everything that God gives you. His mercy is new every day. Amen? I guess I figure if he makes a new batch of mercy every day, I must have used up all of yesterday's. And in verse 10, it says, and you shall eat always at my table. And verse 11, it says, and you shall eat always at my table. And verse 13 says, and let's just read verse 13. Let's look at it together. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, even though he was lame in both feet. I love that. Even though he continued to have weaknesses and failures in his life, he never stopped continually eating at the king's table because Jesus paid for us to be able to do that. Amen? You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And I love this part. You know, Satan comes like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But here's the, here's the thing I want you to understand. You know, there's nothing wrong with you enjoying your life while you're having a problem. I don't think you heard me. There's nothing wrong with you enjoying your life while you have a problem. And you know, to be honest, that, could, that statement right there could be the whole reason why God sent some of you here today. Amen. It makes the devil mad when you're happy. <laughs> he can't stand it when we have joy. Joy is strength. And so many people think if they've got a problem, they just can't enjoy life while they have a problem. Well, he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. While we still have problems, we can go to the king's table and we can eat a fine meal and we can enjoy it. Come on, now you're getting it. You're getting in there with me. You anoint my head with oil. Wow. Summertime is fly time or the sheep, and all types of parasites attack the sheep. This doesn't sound very good, but this is what the book says. Nasal flies are particularly irritating and can even be dangerous. They attempt to deposit their eggs in the sheep's nose where they hatch to form a slender worm that works its way up the nasal passage into the sheep's head. <laughs> 
They burrow into the flesh, and there they set up intense irritation accompanied by severe inflammation. Now you're like, okay, Joyce, I want to see what you're going to make out of that. <laughs> okay, here it comes. Certainly, Satan tries to work his way into our heads and affect our minds and every other area of our living. He is constantly trying to deposit his little ugly eggs that turn into worms that work their way into our mind, and from there, they inflame and infect our whole life, and they begin to control everything that's going on. Because no matter what God offers me through Christ, if I don't believe it, I'm never going to have it. Be it unto you even as you believe. I'm believing for good news today. I believe, every day I say, God, I'm looking for good news. Amen. I don't know about you in life, but I need to be encouraged sometimes. Amen. You know, I, I mean, I work hard. I'll be tired when I go home today. Dave's going to go to the baseball game to see the Cardinals win again. <laughs> Amen. And that's cool. I'm glad he gets to do that. But, you know, I, I may need some good news. And so I've learned not to get mad at people because they're not giving me what I want. I go to God and ask Him for what I want and let Him arrange it. But now look, you're not going to get anything if you don't expect anything. And you're not going to expect anything if you think you have to be good first to get it. And I'm not saying, you know, that we can just live these wretched, awful lives and God just pour His blessings out on us. I'm talking about people who love God and make mistakes and you are sorry for your mistakes and you really are, you're, you're on the path of righteousness. You're getting brighter and brighter every day, but you're still not where you need to be all the time. It's like I said last night, thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm not where I need to be, but I am somewhere in the middle and my heart is to continue pressing on with God. Come on, stop being mad at yourself. Stop being mad at yourself because you don't always do everything right. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy, the devil loves to infect our mind. I wonder just in this room today, let alone if we would branch out into the people watching my TV all over the world, I wonder how many lies we believe. Wonder how many things the devil has told you for years and years and years that you believe are true, and the only way you're ever going to know that they're not is to find out what this says. And you see, the good thing about this is it's not just like reading some romance novel, although it is a romance novel. But there's power in here when you think you're no good and you read in here often enough that you have been made right with God, that you don't just have wrongness, but God has given you rightness. It may take you reading it a thousand times, but eventually that word is going to renew your mind and you're going to begin to think different. And then when the table's set, you're going to get up there and eat. Amen. I've been preaching some version of this message for years, and I don't know, probably 25 years ago, my kids heard me preach this where I talked about when we, sh we should be sitting at the table eating and asking for more. We crawl around under the table acting like beggars and servants being willing to just eat the crumbs that fall off the table. And so one Thanksgiving, we had worked pretty hard to put together a nice meal like most families would. And, you know, there were pies baked and there was turkey and there was everything. And so, you know, I got all this stuff out on the table, just like the shepherd finds those table lands and he really works and prepares and makes sure that everything is just right and everything is good. And so, They'd been watching television, doing different things, and so I, I called from the, the dining room where I had the table all set, and I said, okay, it's time to eat. Come on and eat. 
And my kids all came out and got under the table and started crawling around <laughs> saying, oh, mother, we're not worthy to eat your meal. <laughs> oh, dear mother, we are so wretched. We cannot sit at the table. Just throw a few crumbs off the table and we'll be happy with that. And the thing that was interesting to me was even though I knew what they were doing, it embarrassed me. And I thought, get out of that floor and get up here and sit down. I have worked and made this meal. You get up here and you eat this. And you know what? God wants to say the same thing to you today. Come on. You stop crawling around under the table being satisfied with a few crumbs. And if God says the table's set, then you get up there and you eat. And don't even be embarrassed if you like what you're getting and you say, more please. <laughs> Good news. Good news. You anoint my head with oil. I believe that that represents oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. And so I believe you anoint my head with oil means that you anoint me with the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. I don't know what you do or don't know about the anointing, but to anoint means to paint all over with or to be smeared all over with. And so literally as a child of God, if you know how to walk in God's presence, you're smeared all over with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you have something about you that's different than what's going on out in the rest of the world. And boy, that anointing refreshes you. And it, I mean, it, I, mean I know the difference in music and anointed music. I know the difference in talking and anointed preaching. We need to know, we need to learn how to recognize the anointing because it's the anointing, it's the presence of God on a person or on what they're saying that is what breaks the yoke of bondages off of our life. You anoint my head with oil. David knew the importance of God's presence in his life, and that's one of the greatest things about the shepherd David. Psalm 27, 4 was a life-changing scripture for me. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I might dwell in your presence and behold your beauty all the days of my life. And boy, when God began to teach me this, I mean, I, there wasn't one thing that I wanted. I had a whole list of things that I thought I had to have to be a happy Christian. And most of them were just extra wool stuff I didn't need anyway. Is anybody home out there? And when I began to just say, God, more than I need any of that, I need you. We have to learn to seek God's face and not his hand. We have to learn to want his presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, not his presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E -E Come on. I tell you, that little dog of mine can get just about anything if she'll just hang out with me follow me around, sit at my feet, put her little paws up and want to get up on my lap. And the other night she was sitting on my lap. She got off my lap and went over and got on Dave's lap. And I said, that ain't smart. <laughs> You've only got this happy home because I wanted you. <laughs> but I'm trying to make a point. Listen, if you seek God's face, his hand will always be open. But if you just seek his hand, he may get insulted. In other words, don't just go to God when you want something or need something. Go to him for him. I need your anointing. I need your presence. Anoint my head with oil. Well, we always want to remember that God is a good shepherd. And you know, even though you may have had some things happen in your life that didn't seem good or feel good, God is still good. And I want to encourage you today to always seek Him for who He is and not just what He can do for you. 
Like I say, seek his face and not his hand. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future change our situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give. And we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl. Or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding. And do something that you know will make a difference. And so I'm inviting you to join us in partnership. Help us glorify God and share Christ. Help us help hurting people. Help us feed the poor and get the gospel to people that don't yet know what we know. You can check us out on JoyceMeyer.org and find out all that you need to know about partnership or you can call the ministry. God bless you and thank you for praying about this. Elk gebed and elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Werk, huishouden, vrije tijd en nog veel meer. Het moederschap is een fulltime uitdaging. Groeit alles je soms boven het hoofd? Krijg weer rust, zelfvertrouwen en vreugde die dieper gaat. Laat je inspireren door Joyce Meyer, zelfmoeder van vier kinderen. Je hebt het verdiend. Het boek van Joyce Meyer, de zelfverzekerde moeder. Bestel je eigen exemplaar nu via joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch via 026 2022 100. Hoe zit het met een dagelijkse inspiratie? Inspirerende gedachten levert de dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce per e-mail. 
meld je gratis aan. 